to see it. Sounds good. <clears throat> Okay, first of all, why don't we start a, a, by you giving just a brief de description of what laminar flow is. Hmm. It's an interesting question to give a brief description. Um, in essence, what we're trying to do is control um, the boundary layer so that it looks a lot like, um, in a simple-minded simple, simple -minded way, it would be if you looked at a car that was in a smoke tunnel and you see the commercials on TV and you see the smoke waves going over the car and they're nice and smooth and then later on they burst and they become a big bubble. The laminar flow part is the place where they're smooth, where the air f actually flows over the wing in a very smooth manner in a, in a low drag configuration and a uh, more efficient way. It's, uh, all airfoils have some laminar and have some turbulent uh, flow on them. In the area where it's laminar, it's basically the more efficient portion of the airfoil. Uh, another um, common uh, phenomenon that people can relate to laminar flow would be a cigarette smoke. It's the, the portion of the cigarette smoke that comes off of the cigarette real s straight and smooth and tightly wound, and then later on it bursts and there's this big smoke uh, spot in the middle of, uh, or smoke ball in the middle of, off of the cigarette. That's the turbulent section, the straight piece is where the laminar flow is. So it's the tightly wound, well-organized, uh, smooth airflow air that you're talking about when you say laminar versus now, turbulent. You just mentioned uh, something, and that was the, the phenomenon. What are specific phenomena that are associated, l laminar flow phenomena that are associated with supersonic flight but not with subsonic flight? Well, uh, probably the biggest difference in supersonic laminar flow is that is the airfoils uh, and the wings tend to be more highly swept in that the, uh, the leading edges are, you know, in the order of 35 to 70 degrees swept back from a 90 degree angle. And typically a subsonic laminar flow airfoil doesn't have quite that much sweep. And the sweep actually makes the airfoil, makes it more difficult to maintain laminar flow because you have a component of in, inbound air or an air molecule that's coming towards the swept wing Part of it goes straight back, but part of it goes out towards the wingtip, and that's called cross flow. And cross flow is the phenomenon that makes supersonic laminar flow, is one of the phenomena that makes supersonic laminar flow more difficult to maintain than subsonic laminar flow. It's much more, uh, much more, a, force, a larger forcing function, if you will, for uh, supersonic laminar flow than it is for subsonic laminar flow. There's also another, another concern, and it has to do with the size of a leading edge radius and the fact that the attachment line or the place where the pressure actually separate, the, the molecules actually separate, some go over the top, some go over the bottom, that area would be called the stagnation point or the whole line of those would be called the attachment line. And that attachment line controlling exactly where that is on a swept wing and a supersonic wing is a little bit more difficult than it is necessarily on a subsonic wing. So we're, and su again, supersonic wings tend to be swept highly making it much more difficult to control exactly where the attachment line occurs. So those are the two things that make it more difficult. Um, the pressure distribution itself is a lot more difficult to maintain. You ha in order to maintain it in a laminar flow uh, conducive, a pressure distribution conducive to laminar flow, you actually have to shape the airfoil properly. And the shaping of that airfoil is part of the art, and that's of learning how to, how to make supersonic laminar flow work. Um, and it turns out that it needs some augmentation. Subsonic laminar flow can, can occur, does occur, easily, uh, relatively easily in the natural state. You can actually maintain subsonic laminar flow back to fairly high percent co percentage cores, 35, 40 percent cord. There have been a number of experiments where we've done that, flight experiments where we've done that, and they've been, you know, wind tunnel experiments with them. Supersonically, uh, there hadn't been very much research in it. It's, we know that we can get laminar flow to, uh, you know, an inch or so back. Now we're trying to maintain it further aft. And in order to maintain laminar flow further aft, we have to come up with some method of augmentation. And that's why we're using suction to actually pull the boundary layer, in essence, pull the boundary layer back down and re-laminarize the boundary layer. And hopefully we can maintain a pressure distribution uh, by augmenting it with suction to keep laminar flow extending further and further aft along a wing surface. And obviously, if you maintain laminar flow for a lar larger 
distance, you can reduce the drag of an airfoil, and if you can reduce the drag, you can increase your fuel efficiency. If you can increase your fuel efficiency, you can increase your payload capability, and you know it's just a whole raft of things that come out of being able to maintain laminar flow. You just mentioned um, the fact that you're trying to get it back a little further, back a little further, and back a little further. Does that relate to the different phases that are in the research that you're doing? Um, Indirectly, yes. What we have done thus far with one of the, the F-16XL number one, which was a cooperative experiment with Rockwell International, uh, North American Aircraft, Rockwell, and uh, NASA Langley and NASA Dryden, uh, and to a limited extent, uh, well, actually NASA Ames was also involved in some of the computational work that went along with this. Um, we have demonstrated that you can maintain laminar flow back to roughly 25 percent cord. It's under certain conditions. Uh, the next experiment that we plan for the second airplane is to maintain laminar flow further aft, back as far as 50 to 60 percent cord. So, yes, we are doing it stepwise. The first experiment showed us that it was, in fact, achievable. And, in fact, it might be a little easier in certain areas to do uh, than we anticipated. Um, the real world tends to be a little bit more forgiving. It appears, you know, from a flight perspective, the real world is more forgiving than the computational or the theoretical world says it should be. Um, but we haven't gotten enough of an understanding as to exactly why we're able to do what we're doing. We know we can do it. Now we have to try to figure out exactly what is the phenomenon that we're actually able to, uh, to control to make us get laminar flow to 25 percent cord. Meanwhile, we want to extend that, yes, back to 50 or 60 percent cord, which is a big driver in the design process for the high-speed civil transport airplane. If we can achieve laminar flow that far back, we have actually correlated unit Reynolds numbers to a large enough number that the theoretical people uh, and the designers for the high-speed civil transport have a lot of confidence that when they scale this up to the full-size vehicle, uh, the scaling will actually be fairly accurate. But uh, on the high-speed civil transport, they may not have laminar flow back to 50 or 60 percent cord. But if we can achieve it to 50 to 60 percent cord, now we know we understand the phenomenon well enough to be able to use it to our advantage on a high-speed civil transport. Why was the F-16XL chosen for this particular flight experiment? Primary driver is that it has a configuration that is close to uh, the configuration that the high-speed civil transport is right now on the, on the table. It looks like it's going to look like. It's a very small airplane, but it has a 70-degree swept wing. And the high-speed civil transport designs right now appear that the wing is going to be roughly a 70-degree sweep. Um, the cord is not long enough, it's, but it was an airplane that was available with the right sweep angle um, for test section. And so that appeared to be the right place to start. It's the only one of the few airplanes that are available right now to do that type of work. And that's the other reason why the airplane was selected. It was actually available. Uh, back in 85, the Air Force and General Dynamics parked the airplanes and said they had no more use for the airplane. And uh, in 88, NASA thought that they could use an airplane. And meanwhile, the Air Force was looking for somebody to either take it off their hands or to, or the Air Force was going to destroy the airplane. So we said, we've got a use for it. We'd like to have the airplane. Um, the airplanes are actually loaned to us. They don't belong to NASA. They belong to the Air Force. And they're just on loan to, the, to NASA for the duration of the flight experiment. When you are conducting a flight experiment, what measurements are you trying to obtain? Well, we actually collect on the order of 250 to 300 pieces of data telemetered to the ground. We display to our engineers somewhere in the order of about 150. Among the parameters we're displaying to our engineers are the are pressures, um, coefficients of pressure. It's actually the pressure is measured, and then we run it through a computer to display in a pressure distribution format what the pressure distribution looks like. We also measure uh, and display to our engineers um, whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. And we use a thing called a device called a hot film anemometer or hot film sensor, um, which in essence is a piece of a, a strain gauge bridge. And by the way it's manipulated and, con and conditioned, the signal is conditioned, we can actually tell whether we have laminar or turbulent flow uh, at, a, at a specific discrete location along the wing where these things are located. And those are the two primary pieces of information that we collect. We also collect data on the suction levels. How much suction are we, uh, does it require to maintain the laminar flow at those in, under those various conditions? And of course, the conditions themselves are recorded. 
whether what our mock mock altitude, airspeed, uh, angle of attack, angle of side slip, um, all of those are recorded and, and telemetered to the ground so that the researchers can tell whether or not we are on the conditions that we need to examine whether or not laminar flow occurs then. What do you learn, people that are doing wind tunnel testing, you know, I know they've tested some flat plates and in the quiet tunnel they're testing you know, the, the, what is it, three, first three to four percent right. simulation. What do you learn from them that helps you in what you're doing? Uh, most of what they have done thus far, they're, they're the beginning of the experiment. They're the ones that say, well, if you can shape your airfoil this way, if you, can, if you can build a contour, if you can build an experiment that looks like this, you are most likely going to be able to get through the hardest part of the region, the hardest part of the experiment, which is to get the leading edge to be laminar. If you can maintain laminar at the leading edge, the rest of it will probably fall out. You may have to manipulate your experiment just a little bit, but the, the, the further on will follow. Um, so what we really get out of them is verification of some of the theories that the design theories for our experiment. So the design starts uh, whether it's, in, in a lot of times that is the computational fluid dynamics people start working on what they think is a good design. Then they might fly a small experiment in one of the tunnels. Um, and when they think they have something that really is does show promise, then we'll scale it up to an airplane and do a flight experiment, which will be the in-flight validation of what the wind tunnel said and what the computational fluid dynamics work said. Oftentimes, we don't get 100% correlation in the, in the data. What we get is, is some differences in, in terms of what we get for real-time, or flight data. And we take that, turn it back into the computational fluid dynamics folks or to the wind tunnel people and say, well, our data shows this, but our configuration looks like this. Why don't you run it again, put it through your tunnel again, or put it through your code and see whether or not you can figure out what the difference is between what we got and what you got in terms of results. So there's not always 100% correlation, but we use this as an iterative process. Uh, oftentimes, they don't get the same answers we get, and they're convinced that their part is exactly right, so we have to go back and find out what it is in our, exp our piece of the experiment that might be different. So it's, you know, it takes a lot of communication, a lot of talking between the, the computational fluid dynamics people and the wind tunnel people and the flight experiment people and the applications people and the instrumentation people. Everybody has to talk to everybody in order to make sure that we really are doing the experiment we all think we're doing. And, uh, and we have had on occasion some differences of opinion in terms of what we are doing and what we think we're doing and what somebody else thinks we're doing. So it, it does, it's a difficult process to keep iterating everybody's data until we get correlation. Just to digress for a minute, one of the things that I told Lou Williams is that I was going to make a point of being really fair and objective because obviously when I talk to somebody who's doing CFD, oh, their work is what is most important. And then if I talk to somebody doing wind tunnel experiments, well, those computer weenies, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and what I said, I told them that's a positive thing because that person is very enthusiastic yeah. about what they're doing and that's where their heart is. So what I see is that in order to get a vehicle built and off the ground, there's going to be CFD, wind tunnel, and flight experiments. There's no way that one of those is more important that's than right. the other. But it's really funny to talk to somebody. Do you know who Bernie Spencer is by any chance? I know the name, but I don't know him personally. He's a wind tunnel guy, and he did a lot of testing for right. the shuttle. And I had to interview him last year about the HL-20. Mm -hmm. And he was so funny because he kept talking about the computer weenies the whole time. And I had him on tape, and he called that. I said, we're going to have to rephrase that a little bit, Bernie. We can't call them weenies. And he's just, you know, anyway. It's, I mean, it is a t that's a tough problem, you know. The, uh, and we have... You know, we have our growing pains trying to correlate a, uh, you know, make a flight experiment add the most value to an overall program like this because everybody does have their empire, if you will, and everybody wants to make sure that their piece gets, gets added into the equation. Um, flight is an important part of the validation process, and especially when you're dealing with a phenomenon that we don't understand yet. Um, there are some kinds of of technologies that can be done, you know, computationally or in the wind tunnels, but I think we're in an area now where we don't know enough and we need some flight data to correlate with. And I think overall the program does recognize that and everybody involved in the program recognizes that, but flight's also very expensive. And that's that's a real drawback. Anytime anybody looks at trying to do a flight experiment, they say, "Oh my, we're going to spend millions of dollars doing this flight experiment and we could do the same experiment in a wind tunnel or in a in the computational world for considerably less." 
and convincing everybody that you still need the flight data is sometimes difficult, you know. So when you talk about your computational people or your wind tunnel people and you talk about your air applications people, your flight applications people, getting a meeting of the minds is the hardest thing. You know, getting everybody to say, yes, this is a very important thing for us to do um, is really difficult. And it hasn't been flawless so far in this program, although we're getting better. We're, we're definitely working hard, harder to make sure we're all part of the big piece of the, piece of the program. And I think it's starting to show. To date, how has the, ex the applications portion, how has that been validating the other stuff? What's the success that you've seen? Well, we have, um, we've collected sufficient amount of laminar flow or laminar turbulent transition data and a significant amount of pressure distribution data to be able to show that with minor anomalies, we can, um, we can, we do understand how the pressure distribution is, has been developed. You know, there are some things in the pressure distribution we don't understand, but we're beginning to believe that some of that's our instrumentation measurement technique rather than it has anything to do with the phenomenon called supersonic laminar flow, which is good. I mean, it's, what it's done for us is it's, it's improved our instrumentation technique capability as well, which will make the next experiment a better experiment. Uh, in transition, where transition location occurs, we have been able to show that the codes that, have, that develop, that this uh, airfoil shape was developed by, are not 100% representative of what really happens in the real world. But they're close enough. There's some things that, some phenomenon that they didn't anticipate in the code development that um, need to be re revisited. Um, it's, on, it's fair to say we did not predict the results we got. You know, the computational fluid dynamics and the wind tunnel results did not predict the results we got on the first part of the, in the SHIP-1 experiment. But they predicted enough of, of uh, the information in a satisfactory manner that we now have something to, to, to do some checks and balances against. As I said earlier, now is time for the CFD folks and for the wind tunnel folks to go back and look at the differences between what they thought we were going to flight test and what we flight tested and see whether or not they can st we can start correlating the differences between the two. Um, most importantly, I think the, ex the flight experiment has shown that, yes, you can get laminar flow. And it's not as, may not be as difficult to do under these circumstances as we anticipated it would. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of apprehension that we were going to have to do a lot of, provide a lot of suction, for example, in order to maintain laminar flow. And we're not providing all that extraordinary, a really large amount. We're definitely providing suction, but the amount is not as much as people predicted it would be. So we are starting to show, you know, that uh, that this is a handleable problem. It's not out of our out of our capability, which is a very big confidence builder that uh, we can get from here to there without, you know, without having to go over the impossible, you know, the impossible ridge first. So basically, what we've done so far is just provide the data to validate what we've done so, f you know, what the the uh, theoretical people have done so far, and the, and that gives them the step, the confidence step they need, that they can go the next, you know, they can go to the next level of complexity and start understanding a little bit more about, you know, the differences, the difference between cross flow and, you know, the e to the n factor uh, res uh, computational results and those kinds of, those kinds of computational theories that they're using. They're getting enough data to validate that the theories are valid theories. They just need, they need to be tweaked up and tuned up just a little bit more. How does the, what you need for laminar flow control and what you're finding to achieve the best possible results, how is that eventually going to affect what they need in the, sonic, in the sonic boom area or in the high lift area? Are the, their needs are obviously a little different. <laughs> yeah. Their needs are different. And in fact, the integration of laminar flow, high lift, uh, sonic boom or shaping is going to be a very difficult task um, because they don't meet those those at least those three phenomena don't meet at the same place, so it's going to be a compromise. Everybody is going to have to say um, through whatever whatever validation testing they do, I can tolerate this much de detriment to my best performance condition and still get some gain. Um, it's it's the added va value added 
equation really more than anything else. It's if I have some laminar flow under certain circumstances, but I give it up during the, the approach and landing phase or the takeoff phase. If I have uh, a sonic boom, but it's not as offensive as a, a very sharp sonic boom, and if I have um, you know a noise footprint from the high you know because of the high lift phenomenon that's half of what you know meets the FAR criteria but it's not the, not as good as I really want it that whole uh, compromise and that whole integration issue has not really been uh, addressed yet it's everybody recognizes we're gonna have to compromise high lift and and supersonic lambda flow are almost mutually exclusive for certain parts of a flight regime but you don't need supersonic laminar flow when you're subsonic. So maybe it's not that big a deal. You know, uh, maybe we can work around that one. And I, so I think that, that uh, we have to understand the conditions where supersonic laminar flow occurs. We have to understand the conditions for getting good high lift performance characteristics. And then once we understand both of those, we can integrate the requirements for both in such a way that we don't destroy, you know, 75% of the capability in either case. The worst thing you could have is a poorly integrated airplane, one that does everything poorly. Uh, what we're hoping for is an airplane that has all the technologies put together um, in such a way that uh, we've maximized you know, all the parameters at the same time. And you're not going to get 100% of any of them. And ultimately, what, what, what are you, aside from the test measurements, what, once all the test, test measurements have been done, what do you feel like the purpose of all your research database is going to be? The database uh, will probably be used for years to come to validate, be, be a lot of test case data to validate development of new computational codes and, and theoretical codes. Um, the area we're dabbling in now, supersonic laminar flow, is an area that is, is brand new. You know, there were some experiments done in, in years gone by. Um, there's some X21 criteria that people believe in. Uh, there's some work that was done on a 104, you know, back in the, uh, I guess it was the early 60s. Those two experiments were enough to set, establish some criteria for uh, whether or not supersonic laminar flow is, or laminar flow and supersonic laminar flow were, were achievable. What we have done and what we will be doing through the XL experiment, besides validating some of the codes that the high-speed civil transport is going to use for design methodology, we will actually fill the database that will allow researchers for future generation airplanes augment the designs um, in other ways, not just for the point design called the, the high-speed civil transport but perhaps for some other vehicles, uh, some other more focused, more highly specialized vehicle that could take advantage of an airfoil uh, or a pressure distribution development for another region of flight that maybe we haven't thought too much about to date. So the database by itself is, is going to be valuable to everybody. Um, it's, it's certainly designed to help the high-speed civil transport, but to understand the phenomenon, transition physics and and uh, you know attachment line phenomenon and, and that type of thing. That's the importance. That's some of the important data that will come out of this. I mean, we've played. We've been in the laminar flow business for. Well, if you read some of the some accounts, we've been in laminar flow since the beginning of NASA, or NACA. Actually, there was some laminar flow work done in the in, during the NACA days. Um, I personally have been in the laminar flow business since 1979, and it's been subsonic laminar flow up till now. And there's always new things to to look at. There's always uh, the effect of once you, you know, you take a, a known configuration. Now you start varying very, you know, the parameters. Instead of having 70 degrees sweep, let's look at the effect of 75 degrees sweep. Instead of having uh, maximum suction, let's look at less suction. Instead of having uh, two degrees angle of attack, let's look at, you know, three degrees or one degree angle of attack. There's a whole raft of parameters there that that when you're when you're focused on a vehicle that has a certain flight regime you tend to only look within that window and we'll collect enough data that you can look at the effect of changing the various parameters um, and use that to validate other codes for other flight vehicles. So now the, the F-16 currently isn't flying, it's, it's hangered, right? Both F-16 XL airplanes are hangered right now, although Friday we'll be flying the first airplane again, so. And is that 
are you starting a, a different round of experiments? Excel ship ship one, which is the one that we started the NASA Rockwell North American aircraft experiment with, um, is going into a phase. We'll call it a phase two uh, experimentation, where we are actually trying to document collect uh, significantly more da data on the suction requirements for laminar flow. Uh, phase one was basically can we can we achieve laminar flow back to, you know, 25 or 30 percent cord. Phase two is understand the, the suction distribution that's required to do that. Um, so yes, the ship one is in a second phase where we're collecting another set of data. When that's complete, uh, the airplane in fact will be turned back to, uh, transferred back to NASA Langley where they will begin the high lift experiment where they will actually start looking into uh, the configuration requirements for high lift for the supersonic or high speed civil transport. Um, and Dryden and Langley will be working together on that experiment, uh, with Langley being the lead and most of the flight activity occurring back at Langley and modification activity occurring there. We will provide the support as necessary to uh, get that airplane in the air back there. The second airplane, Ship 2, is the centerpiece of the laminar flow control phase of the high-speed research program. And that airplane currently is configured with a passive glove, which is no suction at all. It's just a foam and fiberglass glove on the right wing. And with that, we'll be examining attachment line criteria, pressure distribution um, verification, since they predicted that they designed the shape based on, on codes. And we're going to go out and see if that shape really is providing the pressure distribution we had hoped for. Transition data, where is laminar flow occurring on a passive surface that's shaped to be conducive to laminar flow in a supersonic flight environment. And that's, that's probably a four to six month flight program that we have planned there. And at the, term, at the completion of that flight program, that airplane will go back into modification for the installation of the big experiment, if you will, and that's the one where we'll be putting a glove, a, a suction glove on the airplane. It'll go on the left wing of the airplane. It'll, be, it'll go uh, roughly back to 50 or 60 percent cord and that one will use suction to try to maintain laminar flow that far back. These gloves are uh, basically almost full span for the 70 degree swept portion of the wing. The, the wing is, the airplane's claim to fame is it's the cranked arrow. It's got a 70 degree swept portion and then it bends oh, three quarters of the way out to the wing tip. It bends to a 50 degree sweep and the section inboard of the 50 degree sweep is where we put all of the experiments because that's where our 70 degrees is. So the second airplane will be a very busy airplane. It's, uh, we're hoping to collect the entire database for the high-speed civil transport laminar flow control effort by the end of fiscal year 95. And of course, we don't have the glove on the airplane yet, so you know we've got a lot of work ahead of us to try to get it all done. So the passive glove, is it, even the first one, isn't on two yet, or it is? It on? is on. It is on, and in fact, we're hoping to to have the first flight for that that airplane in that configuration before the, before the end of August, and we're hopeful that it'll actually be the first or second week of August that we'll actually get the first flight um, with that glove on. When you, when you do the, the suction experiments on one and you're going through different iterations for the amount of suction that you need, what do you do? Do you fill up the holes? I mean, this is a stupid question. No. The, the glove itself is a porous, the skin is porous. It's um, a piece of titanium sheet that has 2,500 holes per square inch, laser drilled holes per square inch. And then beneath that is a, um, a corrugated substructure, and it's, we call it flutes. And basically what it looks like is a piece of cardboard, if you will. If you look at the cardboard cor corrugations, that's basically what's underneath. And we suck the air spanwise using a, a suction pump that's located in the fuselage of the airplane. We suck the air through the, the porous holes spanwise and then, in this case, we're just dumping it overboard because we have no use for it. In a high-speed civil transport, there may be some use for that air uh, somewhere else. But not, in this case, we're not worried about total integration. We're just worried about determining laminar flow requirements. Um, so when we regulate uh, the suction level, what we really do is reduce the uh, suction pump uh, pumping capability. Now, we haven't done any of that yet. All we're trying to do is document how much suction we have right now for the results we've gotten right now. 
we have a fast-paced program here that we may delete some of the some of the nice to have objectives um, and one of those things is to look at the effect of changing the suction level and we, we may run out of time to be able to do that in which case we'll we'll get that data on the next experiment that'll go on the second airplane I'm done oh. that, that was the last thing I wanted to ask oh. okay <laughs> good